I'll continue with uh, the graphing. We'll, we'll do that until lunch, and then in the afternoon, we'll do the exercises. And uh, I'll be around to help you if you have questions. So <coughs> we have another 90 minutes, I think, roughly. So I might uh, go a little faster than before. The two main drawing instructions for RG tool graph are area and line. And we'll look into the possibilities of these two. So here we have an example showing off a line and an area in a single graph. If you combine the two, uh, it's very easy to make a distinction between the area and the line optically. RD's predecessor, MRTG, used uh, this way of, re of representing incoming and outgoing traffic. And if you look at charts today, you see that many tools still copy that initial way MRTG used to present traffic. <coughs> you can also have multiple areas representing data. Uh, that obviously has little disadvantage because if uh, the blue area is before, uh, in front of the uh, whatever that color is, salmon area, then uh, you can't see it. So probably not such a good idea. RD tool 1.4 added the ability to have a transparency factor for your charts. So here I'm picking a color at no transparency, whereas here I'm setting the transparency to fairly translucent. So now you can see both areas because the blue area is slightly translucent. <coughs> the other thing you could do if you had two sets of data was to stack them on top of each other. All you have to do is on the second area you add the optional instruction stack at the end. And then they'll sit on top of each other. Now, people cannot see as clearly the, uh, the way the blue data behaves. Right? If you go back, there you can easily see that it's also something like a sinus, almost, although it seems to dip at different depths. But if you go to this, then uh, it becomes more difficult to decide what the blue guy is doing. On the other hand, it's easier to see what the combination of those two is, uh, what the amount of traffic, the total amount of traffic is, for example. So depending on what information you want to transport, the way your charts look is affected. And you decide when you're creating the chart, what the viewer of the chart will make out of it. Because if you give people this kind of chart, then they cannot figure out easily how that curve is behaving, especially if it's a more difficult curve. They'll focus on the total amount of traffic. And if you want to make a case for having a larger connection to the internet or more capable routers, then you should uh, present your graphs in a way that it's easy to draw that conclusion. Decision support, I think it's called. <coughs> if you wanted to draw a chart showing off the traffic from this week as well as the traffic from last week, <coughs> there is a command called shift which lets you shift data by a certain amount of time. So here we see two new instructions. CDEF is an instruction which calculates something based on other data 
and then stores it in new variables. So here, CDEF basically just creates a copy of A, very simple instruction, and then shift moves B by 3,600 seconds into the future. And therefore, this here is one hour in the future compared to the green guy. Now, if you moved it one week into the future and it was data from the past, you could see last week's and this week's data in the same chart. So you were asking earlier about fetching a certain interval for each day. That's how you could do it on the graph and have one graph showing off each day of a week in, one, in a single graph overlaid. <coughs> now, as you're shifting the data, those additional arguments to the def instructions come into play because now you want the data to start earlier so that when you're shifting it, it still covers the whole graph. Therefore, I'm telling RD tool that it should not pick data starting here, but actually one hour in the past. And then once I'm shifting it to the future, still the whole area of the graph will be covered. Now, in this example here, I'm using the same data twice. Obviously, you wouldn't have to do that. You could also use different data sources and shift them and display them in the same chart. No limitations there. Since when you're reading data, you're specifying which file you're reading the data from. You're not limited to showing off data from a single file in your chart. You can pick data from as many files as you want and then create a single chart from them. Now, uh, in November, I got an email from some, gra some, some guy in the US and he said, yeah, that he was using RD tool. It was really great. They were doing uh, hundreds of thousands of updates every minute on RD tool. So th they have a really large installation. And I'm not allowed to tell you who it is, but you would know them. Um, <coughs> and th this guy is really fond of RD tool. And he said, yeah, th there is this one problem he has. He's creating this chart out of 100,000 RD files. And he's building just a single line representing all the data he's capturing over 100,000 different RD files. And you're creating one chart. Yeah, that's no problem. It's a really huge RD uh, graph instruction. Well, it works. Uh, but he has a performance problem. Because creating that chart with 100,000 RD files is taking too long. And I said, yeah, that's obvious because it has to read data from all these different RD files. And that takes some time. He says, no. Uh, he has a, a very fast disk subsystem. So it's not taking a long time to read data from these RD files. Actually, the problem is that CPU is at 100% all the time while it's doing something. And he, had, uh, he thought that it's probably memory allocation not happening properly inside RD graph. And he actually said he's going to pay me to fix that. And I say, yeah, OK, let's fix it. And um, so finally, two weeks ago, I got down to solving that problem and I investigated it and I found that the problem was that whenever RD tool was accessing one of these variables here, it's doing a linear search. And if you have <coughs> waterproof table, no problem. Um, if you're doing a linear search over 10 variables, it's no problem. But if you're doing a linear search over 100,000, not so good. And since RD tool is using glib anyway, uh, glib has a hash function which lets you store or create the hash to look up things. So I replaced the linear search in RD graph with a hash search. And uh, the improvements were quite 
dramatic. So creating, I, I then created a test program for creating a graph out of, uh, I think it was 10,000 RD files, because I didn't want to wait that long. And <coughs> the improvement, just for a simple graph containing one line consisting of the sum of all the 10,000 RD files, uh, that creation got 40 times faster with that change to a, a hash function for picking out the right variable names. So it's not actually disk access which was slowing him down. So if you're intending to create really large charts, uh, just use the, the master version from GitHub and uh, you should be very fast. Now I'm still fixing some issues with that. The, the, the data selection is very fast now, but it seems that the master version has other issues due to patches other people contributed and uh, I just integrated without uh, too much attention. So the master version is improving over the next few weeks and it'll be very cool and then I'll release it. So <coughs> using all these math things and, and data massaging techniques you can create graphs which uh, really show off what you want the users to see. And one important tool in making people see the right information from your charts is RDTool's ability to do math prior to painting the graph. Who of you has used a, a HP calculator back in the day? Yes, HP 11C, maybe, I don't know. That was my uh, model. So, uh, and HP had this uh, very odd method of uh, doing math where you had to input data and then do an operation on two pieces of data. And RDTool also use it that uses that method to do math because it's very simple to implement and it's quite powerful. It's called reverse Polish notation. And uh, I'm going to show you a little example on how that works. So I want to do that calculation here. And what we see here is a thing called the stack. So in order to do math with RD tool, you have to transport that um, expression here into the stack to get RD tool to calculate th uh, the result. So I push the number 15 onto the stack and then I push number 23 on the stack and you can see as I'm pushing a new number onto the stack, the other guy gets pushed down in the stack. RDTool actually has an infinite stack. So you can push not only four things as in your HP calculator, you can push as many things as you want on the stack and the stack will grow. That was actually that, that customer who, with the large number of RDs, he thought that while it was uh, making the stack bigger, the memory allocation was uh, causing the thing to go slow. But that's already optimized, so that's not the problem. And now that the data is sitting on the stack, I can execute an operation on the data. And I'm going to execute the plus operation. This causes two items in the stack to be aggregated into one item sitting on top of the stack now. So here we have the result of 15 plus 23. And RDTool accepts such RPN expressions as CDEF command line options. So here I'm creating a new variable called B by pushing the variable A onto the stack and then the number 20 and then the plus, causing RDTool to calculate a new line which is 20 above the original line. People use those CDEF instruction, instructions mostly to cause optical effects on the graph. So, for example, if you had that line here, ha has anyone looked at smoke ping ever? 
smoke ping graphs? Yeah. So in smoke ping, you can see the line representing the round trip time of the ping and then some gray area around that line. And that gray area is created by overlaying additional uh, information onto that first line. And the additional information is how the range of uh, when, when sending multiple pings, in what range of time they arrived back. So the sort of the distribution of the of the pings. <coughs> so here, there's one optical effect for you. So the original data is that curve here, but for some reason, uh, someone might think, uh, let's make it less boring and add some distraction for the viewers. And so I'm dividing a by 4. So I push a, push 4, and then execute uh, division. And now I paint four areas and I stack the second, the third, and the fourth on top of the first area. So the final line up here is exactly as the original data was, except that inside you can now see those three colored sections. Now what the purpose of such a graph should be, I have no idea, but it looks better than just one blue flat area. <coughs> and RD tool comes with a lot of instructions in that RPN language. I'm not going to cover all of them, but they're all documented in the manual page. One very important rule when contributing to RD tool, your contributions will only be accepted if they also patch the documentation. So you have to write patches which modify the code along with the documentation. So the documentation you find on GitHub, it's always current. It's always representing whatever is in the code. So what we have here is two areas, and I just painted them, but I calculated a third variable, and it's a comma b max. So whatever, whichever one is higher will be c. And then I'm drawing a line, causing the line to outline the painted area of the graph. It could be a nice effect. So for example, if you have that green area here, and it's going uh, into a white area, it's laid over a white area, then the border of the light green area will not be really well defined because it's so light. And what people sometimes do is that they add an uh, extra border around the light area, which is slightly darker than the area itself, causing it to stand out much better than if it was just the area itself. And that's how you could do that. Now you wouldn't obviously pick red, you would pick some color which is just slightly different from the color of the area. And most users wouldn't even notice that you added that extra line, but the graph would just look better. There is also an instruction called limit, and limit is special in that it doesn't only take two arguments, it takes three arguments. One argument and then two limits, a lower limit and an upper limit. And whenever that guy here goes outside the limits, then it becomes unknown. And unknown in the chart is represented as nothing. So you don't see the line. And therefore, whenever the, yellow, uh, the, the violet line goes outside the range of 30 to 70, it winks out of existence and therefore starts at 70 ends at 30, starts at 30, ends at 70, starts at 70, right? Using that technique, you could change the color of the line depending on its vertical position. So instead of painting the green line, you could <coughs> have another limit saying 70, oops, 
70 to 100 and yet another one saying 0 to 30 and then paint them all in the same graph and then the color of the line would change according to its vertical height. And if you change the color only very slightly then the, the line would sort of fade between different colors. Again, what that should represent, no idea, but it could be done. <coughs> and then there are instructions which modify the actual behavior of the data. Here we have the original data A, which is a jumble. It just goes all over the place. And then we have a trend analysis. What it does, it builds a moving average over a certain amount of time. Here I specified the moving average to move over one hour. And by using a moving average on this very spiky data over one hour, we can see that the data in essence is something like a, hi a hilly curve. That function is called trend. By using a moving average the line is also shifting. So maybe we want to move it back in time. Like this. So now I did the trend but I shifted the line back in time by half an hour. And now it's sort of overlaid to the original data and appears as if the original data was dampened. It may help the viewers to see how it behaves even though it's very spiky. You can also use decision oper the decision operator if in RD tool. So this allows you to almost write little programs in uh, RPN math. This here says if this comparison here, A is smaller than B, then pick A, otherwise pick B. And as you can see, now the area here is always at the bottom. It's always the smallest area covered by one of the two lines. <coughs> And here is an example creating those stacks. Obviously, this could also be achieved using the limit function. As I said, unknown is causing a line to disappear from the graph. And so here I'm choosing which area I'm going to paint by turning an area into unknown as soon as it's below a certain level. And the, 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 opposite, the, the opposite decision on the second area. And therefore, this guy here winks in and out of existence and the green one too, although obviously you could do it to just one and just overlay that. But with that method again you could make all colorful graphs. There is also an instruction which counts. So this counts the position, the horizontal position of the data. By using that counter and the modular operator, you could have the data wink in and out of existence depending on its position, create a sort of a, a bar chart like appearance of your data. You could have wider uh, spaces. <coughs> this here is just a single data point. That's why it's horizontal here. But if you wanted to make the bars wider, what you could do is you could use the pref operator. This guy here picks the value one step back in the time. 
And therefore now we have those bars which are wide but horizontal. So even though the data actually would be spiky, we get even bars because the bar is represented by the current value plus the previous value. Instead of picking uh, the count, so the, the count of, the, of these data samples, I could also base my charting on the actual time intervals. And here I'm getting seconds since 1970, and I'm doing again some modular operation. Here that's half hour intervals, and I'm using that to paint a chart which winks in and out of existence. And as you can see, depending on what I do to the time, I can even shift things around. But then, if I use some very odd interval, I'll notice that my whole graph becomes rather spotty and the, th those nice bars don't show up anymore. So I have to do something about this. And th the problem is that my specified interval here doesn't go with the interval of my samples. The samples were maybe at 300 seconds interval, but now I'm trying to create bars at 1,756 sec seconds interval, and that doesn't, doesn't add up. What I could do is that I... Hmm? Okay, the, re the resolution for that is later. <laughs> you have to wait. <coughs> uh, some background. When I'm doing math on several data sources, the, da the data sources may have different resolutions. One data source might be at one hour intervals, whereas the other data source is at uh, 50 minutes intervals. Now when I, when I try to do math on the one hour intervals of one, hour, of one data source and the 50 minute intervals of the other data source, then there's a problem. Because when I try to create a point in time, there is no data from both data sources. So what should I, what operation should I make? How should I calculate anything? Because they don't align. And what RD tool does is it creates new data based on the original data which does align. And the alignment is determined by the greatest common divisor between those two data sources. So if one data source is at one hour interval while the other guy is at 50 minute interval, the greatest common divisor would be 10 minutes. between 60 minutes and 50 minutes. So if I had a 10 minute interval for both, then that would add up. And the RD tool internally calculates that and builds 10 minute intervals out of those two original data sources and then calculates every 10 minutes. Now what you could do is you could add an RD with a one second step. And so whenever you combine data from that one second step RD with data from, let's say, your hour interval RD, then RD tool internally would convert the one hour intervals into one second steps in order to do math between the two. <coughs> so you create that pseudo RD file, very small one, and its only purpose is that it has a step of one second. And now, by pulling in that guy here, pulling it into the uh, RPN instruction, but immediately throwing it away again, the only thing which will remain is that RD tool will have to create 
a high resolution representation of the original data. And now, when I'm doing my same time 1756 modulo, it works because the data is now available at one second interval and you have your stripes exactly as defined, even though the original data didn't support that. But by combining it with that pseudo RD file at one second interval, things will work out. With CDEF, you apply operations to, ma to data which again gets painted on the chart. But sometimes you may want to calculate data which is valid for the whole chart, like an average for a day. You have a day chart and you also want to know what's the average data rate for the day or what was the maximum or the minimum value of my data. And the VDEF instruction lets you do operations consolidating the whole amount of data covering a graph. And <coughs> so there are different consolidation operations available. One is average, and it says build the average for A, and you can print it at the bottom of the graph, so we get this guy here, or you could also create a line exactly where the average lays. So if you're creating traffic charts for your customers and they have to pay according to their average traffic, for example, then you could paint a line at the average traffic for a month, for example, so that they can see uh, optically for how much traffic they'll have to pay. Obviously, normally it's not uh, average traffic. It's something called 95 percentile. RD tool has a function in there for calculating the 95 percentile traffic. And you could draw a graph at 95 percentile. When you do these VDEF commands, you don't only get something in the vertical space, you also get something in the horizontal space. So if you calculate the max, you get the maximum value, but you also get information about when that maximum value was reached. And so you can paint two lines. You can paint a, a horizontal line and you can paint a vertical line representing the point in time when the maximum value was reached. And if you printed those, you can also print again the level at which the maximum was reached and the time when the maximum was reached. And that would be the code required to do that. <coughs> so I have a line, I calculate the maximum, I draw a line at the maximum, I draw a vertical line at the maximum, and I put the label down for the line, and then I print graphically, gprint, the value calculated, and this here is a sprintf formatting instruction for formatting the number which is going to be printed. And finally, I'm going to use stirf time to format the time printing. And since my time has a colon in its uh, format, I need to backslash the colon to escape the colon so that it gets printed and isn't looked at as a separator in that command string. In the break, someone was asking me about trending and um, thresholding. There are functions in RD graph which let you do trending on the data. So you can build a least squares line using the LS, LS, <laughs> the LSL slope instruction and the LSL int instruction. And what the way this works is that it uses, again, a little trick in 
CDEF math to achieve the painting of a line. Now, in CDEF instructions, you always have to refer to a variable containing time series data. You always have to, otherwise, RD tool ref uh, refuses to accept the CDEF instruction. Now, in order to paint this straight line here, I don't want to access any of the original data because I've already accessed it, accessed it here in order to calculate the slope of, the of that line. So what I do is I access some original data and immediately throw it away again. And then I do calculate the line data. And I'm using the count operator here in order to access the position in the chart, which is one step for each pixel in my graph. And then I can use that to paint that line. Which leads us to Holt Winter's aberrant behavior detection. <coughs> aberrant behavior detection means I want RD tool to learn how my graph or my original data is supposed to behave. And when it doesn't behave, then I want to get an alert. So instead of um, trying to figure out thresholds for yourself, you rather teach uh, Holt Winters the nature of your data, and then it will figure out the thresholds first, and then it will also figure out when the thresholds are uh, violated. The Holt Winters uh, algorithm works by learning about your data. So you have to feed a lot of data into Holt Winters and eventually to learn how your data is supposed to behave. And when it doesn't behave properly one day, it will alert you. So first, some, some general thoughts about alerts. All those charts, they're very nice, right? You can show them in your uh, control center. If you have a large wall screen, you can put all those charts up there, and your visitors will be very impressed. But having someone employed to just look at the charts to figure out when one chart shows something interesting, it's not really a good way of operating. First, it's a sad job for the person who has to look at the charts. And also, they might just miss when something interesting is happening on the charts. So you have to have some mechanism to automatically look at the charts and figure out when something interesting is happening and then send an alert so that people who then can ass assess the situation are only triggered once something noteworthy is happening. So one option is that you just say, okay, if my traffic goes over 500,000, then uh, I want an alert. Now, if you, if you do that, you may notice that every Friday evening you get this alert because your traffic always goes over 500 on Friday evenings, but it's okay. It's only Friday evenings. And so you know, yeah, if the alert comes Friday evening, uh, then it's just that violation which happens every week and that's okay. But you don't want to set your threshold to 600 because then you maybe wouldn't catch something interesting in the, on the other days because then uh, something over 500 would be really problematic. <coughs> so you could say, okay, what I want is something a moving average. So if, if the data changes too fast, then um, I want an alert. And then you catch spikes, stuff which go, things which go way up. And, and oftentimes that's a, a problem. But let's say those Friday evenings, you have lots of spikes Friday evenings. You know, it, they always happen on Friday evenings and it's nothing to worry about. People have gone home anyway, it's just those gamers which are causing 
bursty traffic and there's spikes. But if you're using uh, moving averages, you just get those alerts Friday evening. So say, OK, Friday evenings. <coughs> Withhold winters, you're covering both problems. Hold winters gives you a tool which can deal with data moving around and the fact that the predictability of data in the future change varies over time. Uh, they do that by assuming a few things about your data. First, they assume that data is basically periodic in nature. So in our society here, it's probably often the case that there is a daily pattern to the data. So in the university, people come in in the morning and they start working and at some point they go home. So if you look at the network traffic, you'll see that there's a certain pattern over the course of a day except Saturdays and Sundays, when it will be different. But uh, otherwise, maybe three, four, even five days a week, the pattern will be pretty much the same. There's also a weekly pattern. And then you might have the same weekly pattern all over the year, maybe except for the week of Christmas and Easter. And there's also a yearly pattern. But then again, you have moving Easter and, and so maybe a week is okay. A week is pretty reliable. <coughs> Cold Winters also assumes that if you have one data point at 100, that the next data point will be somehow related to the previous one. So it will not be completely random. It will be 110 or 90 or 80, something, but something related to the previous data point. So it's not just random data, it's data which is actually a curve in, of whatever nature, but it's somehow a curve. It's not just an assembly of data points all over the place. And Holt Winters also assumes that the spikiness of your data is periodic. So maybe every Friday the data is very spiky but that's periodic. It's not happening randomly. And lastly, Holt Winters assumes that these things may change slowly over time. So the most recent data is the most important data. And the further in the past data lies, the less important it is to predict future data. So future data will be most closely related to current data and less closely related to past data, but still related, just less so. And that's the things Holt Winters will do. It'll predict the future value of your data with a confidence band. So it'll say the next value you're going to measure based on the information from the past values, will be between these two limits. So within this confidence band. And so you get this prediction from Holt Winters. Then you take the actual value and compare it with the prediction. And if it's outside the prediction, you say, OK, it's an aberrant value. I want an alert. Now, you can also, in RDTool, say, yeah, but just one failure is not really worth an alert. So I want uh, five failures within 30 minutes, and then I want an alert. And, and that's the amount of, of uh, automatic processing RDTool can do for you with Hold Winters. When you're configuring Holt Winters in RD Tool, uh, it's pretty involved. Holt Winters needs to store metadata on your actual data in additional RA uh, data stores. So you're setting, when you're setting up Holt Winters on an RD database, 
you're creating data stores for your data sources, for your original, uh, not for your data source. You're creating uh, round robin archives for the data you want to store long term. But you're also creating round robin archives for the whole winter specific data. <coughs> there are two main types of uh, round robin archives you have to create. One is called Hold Winters Predict, which holds information for predicting the future values, which is important for you. And a second one called Failures, where it accounts for those times when the data was outside the confidence band. And since you are looking at failures within a very recent time interval, the failures store doesn't have to be very long. You can use RD tool tune to modify the parameters of your Holt Winters aberrant behavior detection model within the RD file. Some of the parameters can be set when you create the RD file, and some are only accessible through RD tool tune, as we will see. <coughs> so when you're setting up a round robin archive with Holt Winters aberrant behavior detection, you have to set up a Holt Winters predict round robin archive. And you define how long that prediction interval should be. Now, all these uh, options you can define here, you can see that some of them are not even on the command line. And the reason for that is those guys here, they're only accessible via the RD tool tune interface. By default, they're alpha. And we'll see what the effect is of those different uh, arguments in next few slides. Now here, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but that's the formula used to calculate Holt Winters. And that's built into our tool. But from the source, I tried to track all the, the bits because I didn't write that code for Holt Winters. That was contributed. And so I analyzed the source, figuring out what the formula was to calculate Holt Winters. And what, what basically happens is that it takes the current data and uses data from the previous period to finally uh, to calculate what should be stored in the next or what should be expected in the next interval. Now the previous period that's periodic nature of your data. So if your data has a, a seasonal interval of a week, then previous period would be a week ago. And next previous period would be a week ago, but the next, so one into the future from one week in the past. What I did is I pulled some original data from an MRTG file. <coughs> so that's my original data as it was uh, available on the web. And what you can see here is that this data is periodic in nature. Those two intervals here, they're probably weekend. So that's Saturday, Sunday. Again, Saturday, Sunday. And I have two weeks worth of data. That's really little. Two weeks worth of data is not enough for doing serious Holt Winters work. So if you're going to experiment with Holt Winters on your own data, what you should do is you should collect high resolution data for a month or two months, and then set up your system so that you can play back the data into a Holt Winters setup and just run it again and again with different parameters, as you'll see 
Now I'll, I'll show you what those different parameters do, but using this technique, you can arrive at alpha, beta, gamma tuning values which represent your data. And then RD tool will learn how your data moves about and will learn to detect aberrant behavior. So with these instructions here, I can create this graph. So what we have here is the very first Holt-Winters aberrant behavior detection graph. The red line represents the original data. We're just seeing one week's worth of data here. And the green line represents the predicted data. And as you can see, Holt Winters is really good. It's predicting always almost the right data. The reason it's so good is that it doesn't uh, do anything very imaginative. It just predicts basically that the data is what it was before. So there is a very high probability that if data is at 100, that the next data point will be at 102, almost. And that's, with this setting, that's what Holt Winters is doing. But what you can also see is the confidence interval. So whenever Holt Winters is wrong, it starts to decrease its confidence and increasing the interval. So for example here, where we have this, well actually it's data missing, and MRTG when it was n not having any data, it always uh, put zero in, or you can make it put zero in instead of the original data, or of no data. And so <coughs> the data behavior here obviously is not acceptable to hold winters, and therefore its confidence interval is going haywire. It's really large immediately, because it says, ah, the data is very strange, so I'm not making any predictions. There you, therefore you have this high confidence interval. And now I'm starting to play with, uh, with the different factors. So I'm modifying the alpha. And as you can, the alpha is the, the change of the baseline. So how quickly do I accept that the baseline of my data is changing? So I'm making a smaller, alpha smaller, meaning that I'm not going to accept fast changes of the baseline. And as you can see here, what happens? Now the prediction changes. As the baseline is changing, the prediction is slower to follow the baseline. And also the confidence interval is growing dramatically because Holt Winters is seeing that its predictions are not true. And therefore it says, ah, I'm not very confident. And it makes a large confidence interval which grows even larger when sudden changes happen, as here. And you can also see here those yellow entries. These are situations where Holt Winter said, okay, now that's too much. Here I'm, I'm sending out an alert. Now, interestingly enough, the alerts don't arrive at very sensible points in time yet. But they're happening. So that's the alpha parameter. By modifying the alpha parameter, you can tell Holt Winters how, how quickly you expect the baseline to change. So now <coughs> I'm just moving the, the, the previous graph up here and I'm changing beta. Let's look what beta is. So beta is the slope. This means the, how steep is the curve? How quickly can the, the, the slope of my uh, data change? Alpha was about the vertical position and beta is about the change, the, the speed of the change. So now I'm increasing beta. And now it seems that 
the confidence band is getting narrower because beta is becoming larger. So it's more accepting of change in the slope. Also, the recovery here from this anomaly is quicker. <coughs> Until now, the period here has been to set to 1, meaning that I don't look at any seasonal interval. I'm just looking at the data as it's coming in. So I, s I tell Holt Winters about the speed of the vertical change and about the speed of the, the slope change I'm expecting. But I'm not telling it anything about the seasonal uh, behavior of the data. And now I'm changing that. So I'm telling it that 48 intervals make up one season. And 48 intervals, that's half our data I'm working with here. So 48 intervals are one day. So I'm telling it now that my data has a one day interval. And you can see that Holt Winters is kicking in after one day worth of data has been passed into Holt Winters because it needs one day of data in order to predict data because it's always operating on the data from one day in the past in order to predict today's data. <coughs> and as you can see, now it's, it's pretty good at predicting, but also as time goes on, it starts to learn how the data should behave. And on the weekends, <coughs> where the level of the data falls down and it's, in it's learned from the past three days that there should be a hump every day. And now on the weekend it doesn't really occur and you can see how it's trying to adapt and also how the confidence band is increasing. So on the weekend it suddenly says, ah, I'm not very sure what's happening here. So I'm, I'm increasing the confidence band. And then on Monday, things are back, back to normal again, but there's this anomaly, and then it'll get all confused. So we're tuning this. by changing alpha again. So now <coughs> I'm telling it that I'm less accepting of change in the vertical. Because comparing today with yesterday at the same time, the vertical modification of the data should be not that large because every day I expect the data to move in unison. And so by telling it that it should be less accepting of change, you can see that on the weekends, you get alerts. Because the weekends do not behave like normal days. And also, here, during this uh, failure, again, I get alerts because they do not behave like my normal days. Now I'm uh, changing alpha again to become even less accepting of change. So I was at 0 0.2 and now I, I'm at zero, 0, 0.3. And as you can see now, it's learning, learning. And on the weekend, it has already learned about the behavior of a normal day so much that it, it expects something to happen which looks much like the original day pattern and sending out huge alerts. Here it's learning still, that's why you get the alerts, but then here the pattern doesn't repeat and you get alerts. And the outage here, interestingly enough, is happening during the night, which is, it seems, after having acquired a taste for things not being normal over the weekend, acceptable to Holt Winters. Because it, it already knows that 
at this point in time, something unpredi unpredictable is going to happen. So it has increased the, the interval. And so as now really something unpredictable unpredic is happening, it doesn't send out an alert. But if it had had more time to adapt to the day pattern, then this would be something which it would notice. <coughs> so now I'm, I'm going for the slope. And again, by changing this pattern here, I'm modifying the way the, the errors occur. And I'm still, the, the problem I'm suffering here from is that I, I don't really have enough data for it to acquire a taste for the behavior of that data. But using this technique with the charts, the optical representation, and original data, you're just feeding it to create the charts. You also find the code for that in, on, the, on the website. You can use your own data and preferably use maybe two months worth of data and an interval of not only 48 hours, uh, 48 half hour intervals, but a whole week so that you don't have the strange behavior on sun Saturday and Sunday, then you might be able to come up with a set of parameters which actually uh, allow whole twinters to learn about your own traffic pattern. Does OpenNMS do whole twinters? No? Not, not, not uh, the standard configuration, but I think uh, using the RD definition in the configuration. You could enable you could it. Make it so <coughs> the problem is now that Holt Winters is creating all this nice information, but as I already mentioned at the beginning of this section, if the information is just showing up in the charts, again, it doesn't help much because somebody has to look at the charts in order to get that information. And <coughs> the chart has to be drawn to get that information. So if you uh, even had someone to look at the charts, you would have to draw all the charts all the time, which would uh, punish your system unnecessarily because most of the time the charts don't show anything interesting and nobody would care to look at them. So there is another way, and it's called uh, the V interface. Some of the commands have a V option or a V name. When you're calling RD tool, now that's Perl example, but you can use any language you want. If you're calling graph V instead of graph, then graph will return information about the chart it just created. So, and the about the chart you just created, the information could even contain the chart itself. So instead of writing the chart to disk, you could have the chart output in that meta information and get the, the data instead of something on disk. So a PNG in a, in a string, basically. And uh, that's all the information graph V will spit out, even when you call it on the command line. So you get the height of the graph, you get the area inside the graph where the actual graph is painted. So if you wanted to create an interface on the web, which allowed you to point on the graph so that something could happen, you could use graph V to get that information and then transfer it to your JavaScript overlay which then would pick out your mouse pointer on top of the graph. And you can get the image data and you also get the values from the charting area. So RD tool does pick a resolution for the vertical so that the labels on, on the y-axis become sensible. And therefore, it's helpful if you can know what the vertical range of the axis is so that if you want, for example, to have a mouse pointer which uh, shows you where it's pointing at with a little counter, then you could use this information here to paint that 
animated mouse pointer. There are other V interfaces, <coughs> most notably update V. Update V works the same way update does. So you give it data and it stores it into RD tool. But while update is silent about its work, update V is not. When you update with update V and an RA file is up, an RA area is updated, then V will, set, will talk about it. And since Holt Winters, for example, updates its failure RA whenever there is a failure, you will know that it did. And then you can raise an alert. So you don't ever have to actually physically create the graph. You just call update V and then RD tool will tell you about all the updates it did and then you pick them out and create your alert. Even uh, simpler uh, alerting systems can uh, make use of that. So if you want to create alerts on thresholds, for example, instead of looking at the original data, which is being fed into RD tool, you could use update V to get the processed data out of RD tool. So for example, if you're reading those counters from your routers, looking at the counters, it's difficult to do thresholds, right? Because it's just counters. So you could duplicate RD tools work and calculate the uh, data rate on your router interface, or you could use update V and then it would spit out the rate whenever it updates the array. And then you could use that to do your thresholding. Saving time and work, some people use RD tool fetch to do the thresholding. So they update the RD files and have a separate process fetching data out of the RD files all the time. And this is very costly. Whereas running update V has no cost attached at all because it, the data is already there. It's just not being output normally. And with update V, you get it output. There is also a third guy called RD tool info, which lets you dump some meta information about the structure of your RD file. So you can find out how the RD file is structured by running RD tool info. I use this in some of my tools to make sure that the RD file at hand is actually the RD file I'm expecting. So if somebody has messed with the RD files and moved them around or renamed them, using RD tool info, you can look into the RD file to make sure that this RD file is actually the one you're expecting to find. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip the caching daemon because uh, OpenNMS already takes care of that as far as I know. So what, I'm, what we're looking at now is ways to make RD tool faster. So as people are growing their RD tool infrastructure, um, 10,000, 100,000 RDs, a million of RDs, then at some point they run into performance problem with their server or the disk subsystem. And to make RD tool faster, various things have been considered and implemented. And one of them is the RD tool caching daemon. The idea is that you store the RD updates in a daemon which then writes them to the RD files only occasionally or when it's required. As far as I know, OpenNMS already has such a system in place. So OpenNMS is able to update RD files only as it needs them to update and therefore that's duplicate work. Uh, the problem with updating RD files is, a, is the following. <coughs> I already told you that the, the structure of the RD file is such that the beginning of the RD file has to be updated on every update. There is no helping it. And the other updates are very small. So when I'm updating an array, in the best case, the only thing I have to write to the array is one eight byte double number. Eight bytes, it's nothing. I just write those eight bytes to disk. 
Now, do you know how writing eight bytes to disk works? I was very naive when I designed <laughs> that. <laughs> it read, doesn't. You read the complete block. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> you first have to read the block because the disk doesn't work in eight bytes. It works in 512 or 4K, uh, depending on, on how old your system is. But it, it's a whole bunch of data, which is modified at once. So if you want to modify a little bit of that data, the disk can't do that. What you have to do is you have to read what is there, then modify it, and then write it back. So it's actually very expensive. It would be less expensive if you wrote just a whole block, because then you wouldn't have to read it first. You just write it. And <coughs> what happens now, uh, don't follow that too, too closely, because I'm not Okay, so uh, what happens is that if the system has cached your data, then it already knows what block is on disk, and it modifies the block in cache and just writes it out. It doesn't read it again because it knows what is there because your OS is the only guy who's accessing the disk. So it's very um, helpful if your RD is cached. It's cool. So, and, and, and the cool thing is you don't have to do anything about it. The OS will cache your RD. Uh, if you do some experiments and you, you create a, a platform where you can create many, many RDs and you try running that with 5,000 RDs, 10,000 RDs, 20,000, 100,000, you'll notice something very disturbing. Your system is going faster and faster and, and you run it Say, it can't be that fast. It must be the caching. Something's wrong with the caching. So you, you run it for hours, and it's still very fast. It keeps being very fast. And you increase the number of RDs, and suddenly, at some point, performance totally crashes. And it's dead. And <coughs> so depending on the amount of memory your system has, this can go for a long time. But at some point, your performance will drop dramatically. And if you did that test with RD Tool 1.2, uh, sorry, with Linux, was it 1.0? I th think it was 1.2. <coughs> then, uh, oh, you did it with 1.1, 1.0, uh, sorry, Linux 1.0. Your system was all fast and good until, let's say, 100,000 RDs. And then you get a new kernel. You get Linux 1.2, and you upgrade to Linux 1.2, and you run your test again, and you find, oh, now it's uh, at 10,000 RDs, and it becomes very slow. So something's wrong with Linux 1.2. Seriously wrong, because my performance or my ability to update RD files has dropped dramatically. And what happened is that the people who designed Linux 1.2 wanted to do something for performance. So they said, when I'm accessing a file, most people will not want to have only one block from the file. They want to have more. They want to have 10 blocks, at least, or maybe even more. So uh, there's a, a parameter called read ahead, where the OS, when you tell it, I want this block from the file, the OS says, ha, ah, yes, but I think you want the other 10 blocks following it too, so I'll just read the whole 10 blocks when you ask me for one. Um, and this behavior changed between Linux 1.0 and 1.2. And 1.2 become much, became much more aggressive. So if you do a benchmark on 1.2 and, and future Linuxes, where you read whole files, you'll find that 1.2 is much faster. Really cool. Except for RD tool, it doesn't read files. It writes files. But since the block has to be read in order to write it, the OS will go onto disk when you, when you want to write eight bytes, and instead of reading one block, it'll read eight blocks. Okay, takes more time already, but what's even worse, it reads eight blocks and puts them into the cache, so that in the future, when you want to access those blocks, they would already be there for you. Except RD tool never wants to access those blocks. So by writing a single eight byte thing into your RD file, the OS occupied, let's say, 4K byte worth of cache due to your one write operation. 
whereas before it occupied less. And <coughs> so due to that, the cache was filling up much more quickly with 1.2, causing the number of RDs which you can keep in cache to shrink. And therefore, the number of RDs you can update quickly to be much lower. This was offset somewhat by people buying systems with more memory, but still bad situation. Fortunately, there's a system call where I can tell the system what I intend to do with my data and how it should behave. And so RD tool 1.3, I think, introduced uh, that system call. So now RD tool is telling the OS, not only Linux, any OS which has that system call, it's telling how I'm going to access the data. And for writing one block, it tells it, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to access that one block. Don't bother reading anything ahead. And therefore, by upgrading to RD tool 1.3 or future versions, you'll notice that RD tool will instruct the operating system to not read ahead. And therefore, it becomes much faster. And I, I heard some stories about J. Robin being slow and RD tool being fast on, on open NMS. You're right. No, it's actually seven, right? <laughs> so, and the reason for that might be, I haven't looked into J. Robin, so I'm not sure, but it may be that J. Robin doesn't tell the OS about this read ahead behavior. And therefore, it fills up the cache too quickly and, and, and sort of kills the performance for J. Robin. Okay, uh, which brings me to the last slide of the presentation. Uh, future of RD tool. Uh, it's been the same slide for quite some time already. Reason being that uh, what I do most of the time these days with RD tool is fixing bugs and integrating patches from other people and not actually writing lots of uh, new code because nobody's paying for that, unfortunately. So. Uh, if you have uh, interests and money, let me know. I'm for hire. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to figure out whether people would be interested in a really mm, full-scale rewrite of RD tool into something more modern with the benefit of the last uh, almost 20 years, no, not 15 years, it has been around. Um, there's a website on GitHub or a repository on GitHub called RD Tool 2.x, where I'm collecting wishes for RD Tool 2.x. And uh, out of these wishes, I intend to come up with a plan for how RD Tool 2.x should look like and a budget for the money that's needed to implement it and then try to use a Kickstarter or Indiegogo to collect the money and see whether that works and it can actually be financed. Until now, interest in RD Tool 2.x hasn't been too great. There are about 30 people who have contributed uh, ideas. Uh, not sure. Although I'm also talking to some big companies where uh, RD Tool is being used, so it might also be that some substantial players spend some of their pocket cash on RD tool because compared to what would be needed to implement something else, it's really, really cheap. And there are some, some really simple things which will also most likely be implemented in a future RD tool. So RD tool should really be able to run as a service so that you can, so that it's not so closely tied into a single machine, for example. Now, obviously, that's already possible using that pipe mode, which I talked about. You could just hook it up to INET-D and run it in pipe mode. Very simple. But that's not a standard way people expect things to work these days. So it should, be a, should have a REST interface and uh, behave like normal web citizens behave these days. Um, also, the whole data format of RD tool, it has some naive ideas about how disk IO works, as I uh, pointed out before. I would like to change that by 
moving into a, a system where there, there is a hot block at the beginning of the RD file where data is normally written to. And once enough data has been assembled in this hot block, then one block of data gets written in the, uh, in the rest of the RD file so that the number of accesses to the other parts of the RD file can be further minimized and therefore making it behave uh, more performant. <coughs> also, uh, something which is going to happen is that the database code and the, the charting code will be more separated because at the moment they're still tied together pretty much. Although their version, you can now compile a version of RD tool which does not have any graphing code in there. So if you don't want to install all those graphing libraries, you can do that. But I want the interface between those two parts to be much more open so then that you can hook up the graphing engine to some other data source or hook up the data engine to some other graphing uh, system. I heard that someone uh, from OpenNMS the Google Summer of Code project is doing a, a web version of the graphing code, which hooks up to the back end of RD tool. Yeah, that's about it.